Paris, December 1920, 26 Rue de Départ. Pete Mondrian is 48 years old, with a long career as a painter behind him. He is a solitary man who doesn't like to mix with other artists. Extremely disciplined, he spends most of his time working in his studio. They call him Pete the Invisible. He has left, once and for all, Holland, the land of his birth, to come and live in Paris, in a little studio a stone's throw from the Gare Montparnasse. Mondrian is passionate about jazz and constantly in search of those new rhythms that have crossed over from America. With his dapper suit, his round glasses, and his air of neatness, he is not the average bohemian artist. His studio is the heart of his creativity. He lives there alone and will do for 15 years. For him, it is an experimental installation, a total work of art in itself. It is a mental space that both protects him from the present and allows him to draw a line through the past. Amersfoort, a large market town near Utrecht. Peter Mondrian is born here in 1872 into a Protestant Calvinist family. His father, a schoolmaster, teaches him to draw. My father used to draw all the time. I left school when I was about 14. That's when I knew I wanted to dedicate my life to art. One simply confronts with one's eyes all those outdoor forms, the riverbanks, the windmills, all those naturalist landscapes in the tradition of the Dutch school. I never painted like a romantic. I was always looking at things with the eyes of a realist. I detested the particular movement of things and people. At the age of 20, Mondrian enrolls at Amsterdam's Royal Academy of Fine Arts. Being young, he needs to test himself and measure himself against his elders to go further than them.
to distort reality and confront those new aesthetics that everyone in the art world is talking about. Expressionism, Fauvism, Pointillism. I felt that if it was to express the beauty of nature, painting had to take a new path. Color could no longer be mere clothing for form. It must become independent and live for itself. Nature has always inspired me and always aroused in me an urgent need to create something. At one time, I was a fierce opponent of modern art. These days, I detest anything that reminds me of nature. I detest the color green. I have banished it from my paintings and from my workshop. n'aimait pas, par exemple, les arbres. Et quand il venait chez nous, euh, on avait un seul fauteuil où il s'installait toujours très commodement et il tournait les dos toujours vers les arbres. Parce que devant nos fenêtres, il y avait justement un petit jardin et il avait envoyé les arbres de la fenêtre. Alors il tournait toujours les deux, ça le gênait beaucoup. Et j'avais toujours l'impression Euh, qu'il s'énervait même quand il voyait les arbres. Alors il tournait les dos. Nineteen oh three. At thirty one years old, Mondrian is in the grip of an existential crisis and withdraws for a whole year to Uden, a small town in the Brabant region. A decisive encounter with the Theosophy movement opens his mind to the existence of higher realities. Nineteen ten. Soon after, a curious and esoteric composition appears. His triptych evolution symbolizes a journey from material reality to mystical revelation. Mondrian has committed himself to a spiritual reality, one that transcends the world of the senses. It is a decisive turning point. Now he must leave his native Holland and set out for Paris, where they all say the history of art is being written. Mondrian decides to transform himself and to start a new life. Paris. December 1911. A new life means choosing a new name. Since the turn of the century, Montparnasse has become the crucible of modern thinking. Abstract art is no longer concerned with reproducing the image of nature, but with representing it. Cosmopolitan new artistic movements are either coming together or battling each other over concepts whose basic intentions are not dissimilar. The Orphism of Robert Delaunay, the Rayonism of the Russian Lyonov, the Italian Marinetti's futurism. And then the analytic cubism of Picasso and Braque, in which the forms of nature have been left far behind. Only the cubists were on the right path, and for a long time I was very influenced by them. Then I realized that Brock and Picasso did not accept the logical consequences of their own discoveries. This desire of the Cubists to represent volumes in space was contrary to my idea of abstraction, which is based on the belief 
that the space itself must be destroyed. To arrive at the destruction of volume itself, that is how I came to use flat surfaces. I want to get at the truth as quickly as I can, and that is why I take everything out until I arrive at the essence of things. I believe one can achieve this by means of horizontal and vertical lines as long as they're constructed in a conscious yet uncalculated way, by letting oneself be guided by a great deal of intuition and by reducing them to rhythm and harmony. I believe that with these basic forms of beauty, completed as needed by additional straight lines or curves, one obtains a work of art that is both strong and true. My artistic life really began in Domburg in the summer of 1914 with the plus and minus signs inspired by the line of the horizon and the vertical breakwaters. One horizontal line that symbolizes the material principle and a vertical one for the spiritual. Nothing I had done up till then mattered anymore. In the summer of 1914, Mondrian returns to Holland to the bedside of his father, who was ill. But the outbreak of war the following week prevents his return to Paris. He will stay on Holland for four years. During his stay in Holland, Mondrian has found an ally in the person of Theo van Doesburg, with whom, in 1917, he founds the De Style Group, which brings together many disciplines, architecture, theater, poetry, music, and dance. De Style is resolutely abstract. It rejects all natural forms. Its doctrine is a new humanist one, which will bring into harmony the human cycle and that of the universe. A new review is launched in which Mondrian publishes for the first time extracts of his aesthetic theory. The rules are strict. Only primary colors may be used. Blue, yellow, red, as well as black and white. Colors are to be applied in flat planes with no mixing or gradation. Only straight or orthogonal lines are allowed. Forms are restricted to rectangles and squares. Artistic ideas are circulating throughout Europe. In Moscow, since 1915, Kazimir Malevich has also been carrying out research in the plastic...